Hi, welcome to a masterclass video in which I will be addressing the properties of lava rock and how it can be used as a fantastic media for epiphytic orchids that need to be grown in pots because of environmental conditions that do not allow for optimal culture when it comes to growing orchids mounted or up in the trees of your garden. I will run the advantages of using lava rock by you as well as point out where I believe that lava rock can be a disadvantage, but not necessarily, it just depends on how you look at it. However, being aware of the disadvantage, I can give you pointers where you don't have to worry at all about using it. The awareness alone can make you apply some tweaks that will have your orchid live in la vida undisturbed for many, many years, which is something we always hear about. It is best to not disturb orchids as in frequent repots, media change, etc. This is where lava rock can deliver on the do not disturb sign that every orchid should have hanging on their pots. Seeing as it is inorganic, it won't break down. So let's get into the fact that we're dealing with inorganic media here. Many times we hear that pot size is important when we first pot our orchids up because the majority of orchid growers follow the wet dry cycle as their culture, which goes by the principle of air around the roots while still being able to water and have some residual water retention so that watering is not a daily chore depending on climate and media mix. Eventually the pot gets too small and if all went well within the two or three years of the orchid's life, the orchid will then have to be repotted into a larger pot and organic media has to be replaced, etc. When that time comes, we usually also clean out the old root system because we need to avoid the accelerated decomposition of the new media to be slowed down. Decayed matter, as in roots, will accelerate the decomposition of media, so off with them old roots. So many times there are references of out in nature, the orchids get this and the orchids get that, which we try to simulate in our different growing environments. But here's a little surprise nugget of information. Out in nature, no one goes around trimming dead roots. On one hand, nature is referenced in many situations, but not when it comes to other things. The question here is why? Out of convenience or necessity? Let me know what you think. Of course, the dead roots out in nature will deteriorate into nothing and get washed off with the occasional rain that comes eventually disappearing altogether. But in our circumstances, organic media does not have that option and the bacteria around dead roots will have a great time spreading to fresh media to get the decomposition process started there as well. Just in case you ever wondered why growers are so pedantic about taking off dead orchid roots, if you were not to have a thing about needing everything to be super cleaned up, then I can assure you that dead roots in a new pot with fresh organic media would not bother the orchid at all. It will continue to grow its new roots just fine. But that is the subject of another masterclass video. I just wanted to bring the matter of dead roots in organic media to your attention to then seg into the fabulous inorganic media that is lava rock. If you are growing with a wet dry cycle regime for your collection but are also fed up of always having to repot and disturb the orchid or spend a lot of money to keep purchasing organic media, lava rock is a great entry media into inorganic growing and it can behave very similar to bark of all sizes without breaking down and without having to repot your orchid in two or three years. You see, lava rock, just like bark, is not restricted to large only. How you use the different sizes of lava rock that can be obtained by taking a hammer to large pieces and bashing them down to the size depending on what you want your orchid to be in, That is, if you don't have a manufacturer who is providing bags of different sizes all nicely sorted out, if you only have access to large pieces of lava rock, get some safety glasses on, a hammer, some gloves, and go somewhere where you can bash larger pieces of lava rock into smaller sizes. And I would highly recommend that you have an area where there are no windows, depending on how hard your blow is. Also, you don't want to be losing any of the smaller pieces because apart from the dust, every single size of lava rock that you get from smashing a large chunk is usable. I don't have the luxury of having a supplier who treats me to different sizes of lava rock in separate bags, but the bag that I bought many years ago came with different sizes which I picked out and separated. Each one has served a purpose which I will get into now because yes, Even fine-rooted orchids will be able to stay in the media for as long as the orchid has space in the pot. 
So let's talk about space in the pot while we go through sizes of lava rock as well. With inorganic media being the exclusive ingredient in your pot, you can plan ahead and not have to even think about disturbing your orchid for six to eight years if you take some measures into account. And these would include how quickly does the orchid grow? What is the size of the individual root? How does the root system behave as a whole? Is it vigorous, branching or not? Does the orchid have a rhizome as it grows new growths? Or does it have a very tight, compact growing habit at the base? There isn't even a need to consider if it is a warm or a hot grower because lava rock, as opposed to leca, does not come with the evaporative cooling effect. So, many of our most popular epiphytic orchids of any temperature preference can be grown in lava rock. We can start with the first point of how quickly does the orchid grow. If it is a fast grower, multiple growths in a year, all at the same time, then the pot size needs to be able to accommodate that and you can go at least three times larger in pot size than what you would consider reasonable if you were to pot the orchid up in organic media. This sounds crazy, I know, but that is what you can do with inorganic media and your orchid will be fine. You can still cultivate using the wet-dry cycle. And the reason you need to plan ahead is, because now, Throwing in the only disadvantage that I can think of when using lava rock as a media is of interest to make sense of what I am saying with regards to the size of the pot being much larger than you would normally use. One thing to take note of, when it comes time to repot, lava rock is the most unforgiving media. It will destroy the layman when we take the orchid out of the pot. And then if we want to get into the network of the root ball itself in order to remove dead roots, well, consider the nightmare of removing the coconut shell slabs that some of our new orchids come in. Lava rock is the same. The roots love to attach themselves to the crevices where they have residual moisture to draw from. There are no smooth surfaces on the lava rock, pockets of oxygen everywhere in the pot, and the roots literally become one with the lava rock. So that is why planning ahead is fundamental, but also super exciting. Because taking away the general care of an orchid, you can pot your orchid up in lava rock and pretty much rest easy for years and years and years. Literally, set it and forget it. Now that you have the vigor of your orchid assessed and taken your pot size to what could be considered extreme in comparison to other pot sizes you may be accustomed to while growing with organic media, you have also given your root system so many years of peace, which will inevitably result in your orchid being a happy camper if nothing else were to go wrong that has nothing to do with being in lava rock. But now that we have smashed large pieces of lava rock to different sizes, where do they come into effect? Let's take our bark sizes and now match them with the lava rock sizes and create the same climate in the pot as with bark, but substituting everything with lava rock. Chunky bark would equal large lava rock, matching the size. Medium sized bark, yep, you guessed it, match the size with a lava rock of similar size. And now that you see where I'm going, you already concluded that seedling bark would be matched by the smaller pieces of lava rock you just got from smashing some large pieces. Et voila, you have all the sizes that you use bark for, but now in form of lava rock. And even the smallest of lava rock makes for a great decorative top dressing, which also acts like a buffer to premature evaporation if growing outdoors where persistent wind can be an issue. I love it. I use it for my Rapiculus lalias. It fits the size, the proportions work out great, so nothing goes to waste except the dust. So let's discuss root size and how to apply lava rock size wise based on root size of the orchid or do you even need to? What I've mentioned before pretty much has you probably already thinking along the right lines. But just in case and for the purposes of this video, I'm going to mention the use of the different sizes and some genius that I have in my collection. Here I have small lava rock. The dendrobium is in a small pot, but oversized pot for the dendrobium because of its growth habit. Small roots, tiny structures at the base, and tight, compact growing base at that. This orchid has been in this pot for three years now, and if it were in seedling bark, it would be due for a repot. However, judging by its growth habit, this orchid is fine in this pot for the next three years, at a minimum, if not more. 
And here I have an example of medium-sized lava rock. This orchid has only been in this pot for two years, but because the pot is oversized, it will be undisturbed for as long as it takes the orchid to fill out the pot. Maybe in six years, who knows? But I hope to be around to find out. It has a compact growth habit, fleshier roots than the fine-rooted dendrobium. The size of the pot accommodates the orchid for many, many years. Why not go back to a dendrobium? Large lava rock. This dendrobium has chunky cattleya type roots and it is large so it went into this oversized pot back in the day to accommodate it for, you guessed it, until it outgrows its pot. Now before you say that the Rapiculus lalia needs to be in rocky media and that it doesn't count, let me interject right here. The orchid came in medium sized bark and it can be grown in bark. I just have 99% of my collection in inorganic media, so that is why I opted for medium baba rock. If my wallet were different, I may be growing in bark and other organic media, but that is not the case. So you can expand on these examples and think any orchid with chunky roots that was accustomed to chunky bark in a wet dry cycle, that would be the combination for which to use large lava rock and so on and so forth. But to clarify, if you have seen holes on the sides of my pots, you are now saying, but you're not using lava rock with a wet dry cycle. Yours are in semi-hydro and self-watering to some degree. And yes, that is true. Versatile, versatile. That is what lava rock is. But the reason being is my climate. I have little to no humidity to speak of and a wet dry cycle culture here in southern Spain would drive me nuts and not make my orchids very happy. For that reason, I have lava rock in semi-hydro and self-watering. So the setup is conducive to my climate and my watering regime. And now is the time to tell you that lava rock does not have any wicking properties. So why these setups which depend on wicking for optimal water distribution? This is where the different sizes of lava rock come into play once again. I am using different sizes of lava rock to keep an evenly moist climate in the pot because lava rock has many porous cavities that retain a lot of water and the evaporation of the moisture within the pot starts at the top and moves downward. The reservoir at the bottom would clearly be the last to evaporate completely if I did not water for a long time. Depending on the size of the pot and the watering requirements of the orchid, I can use large lava rock as crocking and then fill the rest of the pot with medium or small lava rock to suit the vigor and size of the root system. As a result, the roots always have access to moisture and the reservoir ensures that nothing dries out too quickly before I flush or fertilize again. I have many repot videos where I show the layering and sometimes I add ceramus based on how thirsty an orchid is, but this is not about ceramus. The same water retention can be achieved by using medium to small lava rock which in itself holds water even though it does not wick. So I hope that makes sense. Going back to the wet dry cycle culture though, if you're not into semi-hydroponics or self-watering, it can be achieved by still using the same pots you have for the orchids in which you use bark. If you have holes on the sides of your pot, not a problem. If you have pots that only have the drainage holes at the bottom, not a problem. All you are doing is matching the size of the lava rock with the size of the bark you are going to use and you and your orchid are good to go. If you were to have had sphagnum moss in your media mix before changing to lava rock, you can eliminate that altogether because the crevices of the lava rock will be your source of water retention, just like your sphagnum moss held onto water for that little bit longer so that your pot would not dry out too fast. If you're still with me, thank you so much. And if you find this video informative and useful, take a moment to hit that like button and possibly share it around to others that you think may benefit from the information provided. Both these actions really help the channel and I appreciate the support. Thank you. Now, I'm going to circle back on the thought of dead roots being removed to avoid fresh organic media breaking down fast because of cross-contamination of the decayed matter, accelerating the decomposition of fresh media. With lava rock, if you choose to leave dead roots on the orchid, you can do that because they will provide a form of anchoring. And seeing as you're dealing with inorganic media, any decayed matter will flush out as and when you water or flush your pot and there is no room for concern of the pot turning acidic too soon. I have cut off all dead roots from orchids that I then potted into lava rock, but had to tie the orchid off on a support to ensure stability. Now, 
If you see me not cutting dead roots off when I work with lava rock in future, it is because the anchoring has its advantages and I don't have to use as much wire around the orchid for stability, which to me can sometimes be an eyesore. And one last benefit, a top heavy orchid will not fall over as quickly because size of the pot and because lava rock will provide a sturdy base with plenty of weight to keep that from happening. No more sacrificing space in your pot by putting rocks at the base. No more having to be careful with how much media can you fit in your pot because rocks are occupying that space. Your pot can be all media and your top heavy orchid won't be at risk of falling over. So now you may be wondering why I do not use lava rock exclusively in all my self-watering pots, seeing as it is cheaper than Lekka as well. The reason being, some pots would be far too heavy and I do not have the space to accommodate pot sizes that I would opt for to maintain the principle of do not disturb. As an example, my biggest circle shaped pots are 20 centimeters and I'm on a repot schedule of every two, maximum three years, just the same as if I were growing in organic media. So I would have to consider a 30 centimeter size pot in order for me not to repot every two or three years. And that is a huge pot times X amount of orchids and then the weight issue. <laughs> I would be sporting some serious guns. <laughs> Now, if I had ample space for all seasons, lava rock would probably be in most of my pots because it is a cheaper investment than Lekka is at the start of any collection going exclusively into inorganic media. I would also briefly like to touch on the subject of salt accumulation within lava rock. Lava rock will very, very quickly tell you if you are over fertilizing because it will show up with white residue on the surface of the media. This can be positive or negative depending on how you see it. Positive because you will know that you have to reduce your fertilizer level seeing as your orchid is not taking in the amount you are providing. Negative because you will need to figure out if it is your ambient humidity that is too low and has nothing to do with your fertilizer levels and if the salt buildup is there because your climate is too dry and the liquid evaporates faster than your orchid is able to absorb the nutrients. This is a call that you can make after observing any form of mineral buildup if it were to happen. In my dry climate, I have only had salt buildup on the baskets of tolumnias, which are not in semi-hydro or self-watering. My dry climate evaporates the water super quick, which is great, seeing as that is what tolumnias like, but Dum Dum here also applied 300 parts per million of fertilizer back in 2019, and that was a wake-up call, a facepalm moment, a what are you doing, what were you thinking moment. If I had not seen that salt build up and seen my roots go crispy, I would have lost my entire Tolumnia collection. So I take it as a positive. The lava rock exposed a mistake I was making, allowing me to react quickly and correct it just in time. None of my pots with lava rock in semi-hydro or self-watering that get 300 parts per million of fertilizer show any signs of mineral buildup. So lava rock, just like bark, will let you know very quickly if you are too heavy handed with your fertilizer and then you can respond unless you need to check your humidity levels and your fertilizer levels are perfectly fine but the evaporation is happening faster than the orchid can absorb the nutrients. How I solved the problem with the salt buildup around my tolumnias was I picked off the worst pieces of lava rock and soaked the baskets in plain water during the months of 2020 to correct my excess salts on lava rock that I could not remove. My tolumnias recovered, thank goodness. <laughs> the salt buildup though is not to be confused with white discoloration that can appear after years of a piece of lava rock exposed to the sun. That is just normal fading of the color and the part most exposed will turn a grayish color at first and eventually go white in some places. To determine the difference, if you take a nail and just try to remove the white, then mineral buildup will come off easily in form of a little white dust, whereas any fading would not, and you can test the fading by wetting that area and the color of the lava rock reappears until it dries again and goes back to a light gray or whitish color. Now, another thing that can happen, doesn't have to happen, but can happen, that lava rock can act as a desiccating agent on roots if 
a root tip is exposed to direct sun for an extended period of time and the lava rock has a chance to heat up. Should there be a chance of that happening, a light misting of the surface of the media is enough to stop that from even happening. Despite having tulumias in a very harsh wet dry cycle and having other orchids in semi-hydro or self-watering, I have never ever had a root tip die because of being on the surface of lava rock, but it has happened with Lekka. So in southern Spain with that hot beating sun, the tiny tiny fragile roots of tulumias in that wet dry cycle in their little baskets, not once did a root tip die because of the lava rock heating up. But I wanted to bring that to your attention because it wouldn't be fair if I didn't do so. Now to prepare lava rock for your orchids, basically all it needs is a good hose down with a jet stream setting from the hose pipe or a good roll around in a sink to remove dust and debris. However, I prefer to go a step further because the one-off rinse is only going to remove the main layer of dirt or dust. I prefer to soak my new lava rock straight out of the bag for an hour or so, maybe a couple of days if I forget, <laughs> and then take a jet stream to it, after which I boil it in the cleanest water that I have, the one with the lowest parts per million, so that I don't introduce mineral salts into it by using tap water with high ppm levels. This gives me the feeling that my lava rock is as clean as I can get it, and it is also sterilized through the process of boiling. A good 10 to 20 minutes of boiling. If you choose to do it this way, you will be surprised just how much more dirt comes off what you thought was clean lava rock after already having hosed it down. And if I recycle my lava rock, which is awesome, then I do the same. I clean it and boil it and then I separate it out, sort it into different sizes, store it dry, ready for when I need it again. For this masterclass, I think I've talked enough. <laughs> I mean, I could go on and on, <laughs> but I encourage you to change what up to now has been a monologue into a dialogue and leave any thoughts, any questions, or even your experience with lava rock if you use it in the comments. I hope that this video was of interest, helpful, and informative. Thank you so much for your time and for listening. I wish you a fabulous day on one condition though, that you please stay safe. Take care. Bye.